gonna start recording. I'm gonna share my screen. Um, if you guys have questions, uh, you know, just let me know. Uh, you can raise your hand or you can start talking and I'll go over it. Um, this site that you're looking at now is uh, a site that I use uh, most semesters for like most of the stuff in the class. But since we're online this semester, I'm using Blackboard more to kind of manage the class. Um, but my lectures are still here. So I'll include links to these um, that you guys can look at. Um, the first uh, lecture is just this intro to game design. Um, I basically have this website set up so that you can read it as just like a regular website. Um, but I also use it as slides when I'm doing, you know, my whatever uh, lecture. So I'm going to put this link in the chat so you guys have access to that info if you want to review it. Um, and, you know, uh, it'll be there. Um, and yeah, I'm just going to go over, I'm going to basically be talking about some really basic terms that apply to all different types of game design. Um, and so there's some terms that I want us all to have sort of be on the same page about as we uh, start to talk about games. Um, so let's get started. Um, whoops. Okay, so introduction to video game design. This is our, our first lecture, uh, just going over the basics. So really simple stuff. So there's our game pad. Um, and the reason I start with the game pad is because we wanna highlight uh, what game design is really about, um, which is interaction. Okay, so games uh, and game design, um, you know, the thing that makes them different than any other type of media is that they're interactive. Okay, so as opposed to a, a movie, um, a work of art, a poem, uh, a comic book, um, you know, some of those things might incorporate interactivity in some way. Like if you're watching a film, you know, there are some interactive films where you can kind of choose different endings and stuff like that. But games are a constant interaction between the viewer or the user and the media. Um, so that's really what makes games different, and that's what we'll be talking about a lot. So interactivity is sort of the principal element defining games as a separate medium. Okay, so here's our little diagram, my little uh, kind of bad drawing of uh, interaction. You can see uh, my little eyeballs in my ear over here. Uh, those are the way that we perceive information coming out of the game. Um, that's called feedback. Okay, so I'll talk about feedback a lot. Feedback is uh, what we get from the system, uh, the game system. Um, so usually that's mostly visuals, okay, but it's also sound. That's my drawing of sound. Um, and sometimes it's also, you know, your, your uh, gamepad buzzes. Okay, so th these are different feedbacks that we get from the game. Um, that gives us information about what's happening in the game. And then we, you know, use our controller to put input into the game to change what's happening. So there's this constant cycle of feedback happening when we're playing a game that we have to keep in mind as we're designing the game because we have to think about what's happening in the game versus what's happening in the brain of the player over here. Um, so that's our... Uh, interaction system. It's constant cycle of I press buttons and things change in the game. Um, hey, Cam, you have a question? Yeah, so it's something like the uh, PS5 controller with the adaptive feedback, right? Yeah. To, to make it more feel like more immersed in, into the world. Exactly. Game. Yeah. Yeah, that's a really good, um, you know, immersiveness or immersion is another thing that we'll talk about. Um, and by, you know, that's, that's a really good example of like adding more input or adding more feedback creates more immersiveness um, in the game because it kind of like recreates reality, right? If we have both visual and auditory and haptic feedback happening all at the same time, it's like recreating our, you know, our experiences. Uh, Travis. Yeah, I was going to ask, um, I, I didn't mean to interrupt, but, um, uh, what is what is like like some of the programs we're gonna be using for like to make make like a like a two D game or something or so mainly we'll be using uh, the Godot engine which is like an open source free game engine um, but I'm gonna go we're not gonna use it for like at least a week or two so I'm gonna go over that more uh, in a future class all right.
Okay, thanks. I'm gonna keep going, um, but feel free to jump in whenever. Okay, so when we're talking about a system of interaction in a video game, uh, we have to have encouraging e exploration and understanding of the interface. Okay, so the interface is the thing that tells us what to press on. So sometimes that's very simple. It's just a piece of text that says, hit the A button and you'll jump or whatever. Uh, but sometimes it's more subtle. Like, you know, there's a light that we walk towards or something like that. So the interface is how do we interact with the game? Um, the game world is separate from the interface. So using the system is one thing We're you know, clicking on the interface or hitting the buttons on our gamepad. The world itself is a separate thing. They're obviously related, uh, but a good interaction system in a video game makes us want to explore the world of the game. We want to see like what's on the other side of the world. Um, we need to be able to master the tools of the game. Okay, so if the game is just running and jumping, you know, that's pretty easy. But if there's a lot of stuff that are involved in the game, the interface has to teach us how to do all of those things. Okay, so different types of input. Can I mute the chat? The chat is distracting during the lecture. Uh, yeah, the chat is a little bit uh, distracting. I actually don't know if you can mute the chat. It's a good question. Uh, yeah, okay, so you can turn off, um, oh, you guys can't see my Collaborate channel. If you, if you go to the settings gear in the Collaborate menu and go to notification settings, you can actually turn off the audio or the pop-up for chat. So you guys might wanna do that. I'm actually gonna turn off the audio because uh, I didn't even really think about that. Um, but I'm going to leave it on for raising your hand. So if you guys raise your hand, I'll definitely see it. Uh, Travis. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm looking at the, the Godot thing. Do I download the the mono version or the standard version? Uh, I think standard, but it kind of depends on what your computer is. But we'll go over that. Um, you, you don't have to, don't worry about that right now. We'll go over that uh, in the future. Okay. All right, so input, we have the keyboard. Um, obviously, uh, the thing about the keyboard is it's just a bunch of buttons, okay? So they're all really switches. They are on or off. They're very simple, but there's a lot of them. So we can assign them to all sorts of different things. So the keyboard, basically a button, there's two parts. You press it down and you release it. And that's the whole interaction. But there's actually a lot that happens in there. It, you know, you guys are gamers, so you know that there's a big difference between hitting the button once, uh, you know, really quickly or holding it for a while. We can use this very simple interaction to do a lot of different things. Um, so we have the keyboard, it's a bunch of buttons essentially. Uh, we have the mouse, which is really uh, two buttons and then, uh, you know, two uh, what, what I'll call like range sensors or analog sensors. So a button is either on or off. An analog sensor or range sensor has like a, it goes from like zero to 100 or zero to 500 or whatever the value is. So with the mouse, it's actually sensing how fast we're moving. So if we go really fast, then it moves farther. If we don't go as fast, then it moves more slowly. Uh, so it's kind of like changing uh, location over time. Um, and you know, there's different examples of that. Like on the, on the game pad, you have your, uh, your joystick, uh, which is not just on or off, there's like a range of values. So that's another thing to think about with input. Um, we have the game pad. Uh, this is the older game pad, which is actually just buttons, but we have what is like the axis. And now on newer game pads, you know, we have like the little uh, stick. So we have uh, a wider range of values there. Um, Hakem, did you have a question? Yeah, so like uh, the sensitivity of the mouse, that's what you're trying to say, right? Like mm -hmm. uh, for shooting games? Is, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So uh, the main difference is the button is either on or off and uh, the mouse or the uh, control stick, there's like a range from like zero to 100, basically. Um, so other types of input that are slightly less common, uh, voice or sound input. So there are games uh, and interactive things where it can sense if you're talking or if you're singing along with something. Uh, 3D sensing like the Microsoft Connect or the Wii sensors. Uh, motion controls, exactly. Uh, arcade guns are kind of like light sensing, uh, you know, in early arcade games. Other haptic sensors, um, the most obvious version is like Dance Dance Revolution, like you jump on something and it senses that force and that changes the game. Um, so 
these are other types of input that are, you know, less common uh, just because they require, you know, you have to have more setup. Um, another thing to add to that actually would be like a VR setup. Like if you have like a, like a Vive or something like that, where you have like 3D cameras that sensor your, uh, where you are in the room that can sense your movement. So that's another, another type of input. Um, output, same thing. We've got video, we've got audio, we've got haptic feedback. There's probably other types of things there. Like, you know, there's like 4D cinema where they have like smells and stuff like that. But uh, for our games, that's basically what we have. We have what's on the screen, we have what we can hear. And then if you have a game pad, you might have like, you know, buzzing or what other haptic tech feedback. So all that feedback is used to communicate information to the player about the state of the game. Um, and so this is something that we're going to be talking about a lot is this sort of division between the player and the, and the, and the system. You know, if you have like your player over here and you have your game over here, the game keeps track of all this information. Okay, so like it has like the level, it has the score, uh, you know, it has the difficulty, all these different types of information. These are called states. Okay, the state, you know, the level is a state. It starts at one and it goes up to two and the game keeps track of that. Uh, the score is a state. Okay, so you have zero and then you score a goal and then you have 100 or whatever it is. So that's another state. So the game is really keeping track of like all these states that are changing. And the player, you know, the game has to make the player aware of these states. So sometimes it's just as simple as saying like, this is level one, you know, in the corner of the screen. Uh, but sometimes there's other ways of communicating those states to the player. So like for the difficulty, you know, some part of the game might be difficult and it might not say like, this is the hard part of the game, but the gameplay starts to get harder. And so we know that the state of the game is getting more difficult. So there's this constant sort of like back and forth between the player and the game, where the game is keeping track of all this information and changing because of things that we're doing. And a lot of game design is managing those states. So you have to decide what are the most important states? Is it the level? Is it the score? You know, all these other things that are happening. Um, so, some examples of states, the level, as I mentioned, the score, other metrics, you know, there's all games have different types of metrics, like the health of the player, the speed of the player, or, you know, other components, uh, the player status, um, information about other players in the game, if it's a multiplayer game, like the location in the world or their, you know, level or other things like that, those are other states. Uh, and then information about other actors in the game. So, you know, if you have like um, an NPC character or a narrator or, you know, other things that are happening in the game. So these are all states. That's uh, one of the terms that we want to remember is game states, things that the game keeps track of. Okay, so another term that I'll use a lot is positive feedback. Uh, this term is a little bit confusing because of the word positive. We usually associate positive with something that's good, but positive feedback doesn't have to be like something that we want to happen. Um, for example, dying can be positive feedback uh, if it's communicating, why did we die? Okay, so positive feedback is clear feedback that we understand what happened. Um, yeah, Hakem, go ahead. Like, uh, like Dark Souls and stuff, how you keep on constantly dying, but you still want to progress to the game. Well, so that's, that's actually a good thing that, we'll, you know, I'll talk about in a second is like that balancing that feedback and different types of players are also, you know, come into the case there. And Dark Souls is actually a really good example of a game where it's like, you know, you're going to die a ton of times and you have to be, you have to really be committed to the game uh, to keep playing. So that's something we have to think about as game designers. Uh, yeah, Brian. Yeah, I just wanted to say that I'm pretty sure you're more so talking about, you know, death animations and stuff like that. Well, no, well, animations are a good part of that feedback. So, like, if your player just disappears all of a sudden, you know, you might understand that you died. But if you have a really good animation where you're, like, you know, bleeding and all this stuff, that actually – that really enhances the experience or like that is sunk by a bee and then bloating up yes <laughs> yeah having a good animation is a good way of reinforcing what's going on in the game so that's a good example 
Um, so positive feedback has to be easy to understand and it has to motivate the player to get better at the game. Okay. So, uh, you know, if we're, if we don't know why we died or we don't know why we fell off the mountain or, you know, it's, it, it doesn't, we don't, it's not clear how to do it better. Um, we're not going to want to keep playing the game. So like if you're, if you join a game and the first thing that happens is you just get like eaten by a bear and you have no idea how it happened you're probably not going to want to play the game again because you don't believe that you know how to beat the bear. But if it's a game that leads you into it, uh, where, you know, uh, in Mario, you have the mushroom coming towards you and it kills you, you can see that you have some space to jump over the mushroom. So even though you died, it gives you feedback to understand how the game works so you can get better at the game to keep playing it. So we have to think about that as game designers. How do we give feedback to the player? So the example, game over, uh, you know, even though we didn't want to lose, it is a form of positive feedback because hopefully it develops our understanding of how the game works and makes us want to play it um, again. Uh, so, you know, a lot of games, you have to balance it when you're playing a game. I've been playing this game, Outer Wilds, recently, um, which is, is a really nice game, but it's really easy to die. And then you have to start over at the beginning of the level, which takes a while. And it's really annoying because you're like, literally, it's like, I'll just be walking and all of a sudden I fall off the cliff and I have to like go through this whole narrative again, just because I wasn't paying close attention. So even though I really like a lot of aspects of the game, this, this part of the game system doesn't really motivate me to keep playing. It actually motivates me to not want to play anymore because I don't want to have to repeat the same steps that I've, I've already done a bunch of times. Um, so we have to think about that as game designers. How do we how do we balance those those types of feedback? Uh, yeah, Jean. Wait, was it um, Outer Wild, Wilds or Worlds? Because there's another game called Outer Worlds. Um, what were you talking about that game? Uh, yeah, I think I was talking about Outer Wilds. Yeah, I know you're talking about yeah. Outer Wilds. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah, I just started playing it like a week ago. I haven't gotten very far. Oh, but yeah. I was getting right. really annoyed at the beginning. Uh, but yeah. Um, okay, so game mechanics. So game mechanics refer generally to the system of rules that governs how a user interacts with a game. Um, so a really, you know, for a simple example, think of tic-tac-toe. With tic-tac-toe, you have nine spaces. One person goes first. You can place a zero or an X, and then the next person goes, and you keep going until you either have a row or all the spaces uh, it, are full. Okay, so that's literally the whole game. I just explained all of the game mechanics in like 10 seconds. Um, and then you can think about that as you get to more complicated games like chess. You have more spaces, there's more ways the characters can move, and there's more possibilities for what happens. And you know, those are the rules the game mechanics describe the rules of how you play the game, what you're allowed to do and what you're not allowed to do. Um, so we use game mechanics. Each game mechanic has to be simple, right? In chess, even though there's a lot of rules, the rules themselves are very simple. Like with the pawn, I can move one or I can move two. And as we build up these simple rules, we end up with a complex world that, we, that creates the game and creates the experience. Um, and so the way that that works together, we have an interface that allows us to make actions. So in the, you know, in a chess game, the interface is the board. You, we can move the pieces, and so that's how we make the action. In a video game, the interface is um, our controller and what we see on the screen. The game records those actions. Okay, so that's, you know, with chess, the game itself is a recording of what we've done so far. If I move the pawn, the pawn is there and it stays there. So we've recorded that action. In a video game like Mario, you know, we have a number of lives. And if we lose a life, the video game, the computer, you know, keeps track of that number for us. So we don't have to keep track of it. Uh, that state change is communicated as feedback to the player. So when we die, we have an animation, the number goes down, so we understand what's happening in the game. That's the feedback. And then we as the player or the user, we interpret th that feedback and then we, we make new uh, inputs based on what we've learned. 
And so that's the cycle that we're talking about that just keeps going when we're playing a game. Game dynamics. So this is a, a term that's very similar to game mechanics, but game dynamics is a little bit different. Game dynamics is the product of those mechanics, and that determines the experience and the progress of the game. So again, tic-tac-toe, there's very few rules, but the rules work together to affect how the game is played. So most games of tic-tac-toe end in a tie, and they happen very quickly. That's the game dynamics. It's our experience of the game, how long it takes, how hard it is. Uh, all of those different experiential components are the game dynamics that result from the mechanics or the rules. So with good guide dynamics, the rules are very easy to learn, okay? So it's very easy to learn like chess, uh, using the chess example. There's a bunch of rules, but they're all very simple. You can move the pawn, you can move the knight over one and up two, um, but it's not easily easy to master necessarily. So, you know, tic-tac-toe is a very simple game. It's not gonna take you that long to learn it. Chess is much more complicated. It's gonna take you longer to learn it and way, way longer to master it. Uh, I can. Yeah, so it's something like the uh, Champions and League of Legends, right? So it's like, they could be easy to master. I mean, no, it can be, the character could look easy, but it's going to be hard to master it, right? Something like that, or? Right. Yeah, no, that's a good example, because you have a character that has a few traits, so you can understand what those traits are and how they work in the world. But actually playing the game and seeing how those, you know, those traits play out, it takes a long time to understand what are all the possibilities or what are all the outcomes of these specific traits. So that's a good example. Um, users in direct control of the game avatar. This seems obvious, but sometimes, you know, games don't do this that well. Uh, again, using chess is very obvious. You can see where the pieces are and you know which pieces you can use because they have, you know, you're either white or black. You know which color you are, so it's very obvious. Uh, that's Seems obvious, but it's important to get that right. Uh, players improve through gameplay, sort of what we were talking about. If you have a game where you don't improve, you're not going to want to play it, right? Through gameplay, you learn, oh, if I, if I do this move, I am going to do better. If I do this other move, I'm not going to do well. Uh, so you learn how to play through playing the game. Um, immediate feedback. Uh, this is like, you know, Basically, if somebody does something, if I hit the jump button, I have to jump. I can't jump like a second later or else it's going to be very confusing. So when I hit the jump button, I have to jump right then. It can't be like in 10 seconds you're going to jump. Otherwise, I won't understand that hitting the button did the action. So again, it seems obvious, but it's important to keep in mind. Um, sufficient feedback. So this is like, you know, if I fall in a well uh, and I die, uh, it's clear that, you know, the game ended or whatever, but it, it has to be clear that the reason the game ended is that I fell in the well. So if there's like a bunch of other things happening or something like that, this just has to be clear. So there has to be immediate and sufficient feedback. I have to understand what's going on and why. Uh, and then an important one is the game allows recovery from mistakes. So if you play a game, again, it's really obvious, but we have to think about it as a game designer. We have to think about these really basic things is if I'm playing a game and I die and it's over, that's, you know, I'm not going to want to play the game again. So it has to give me the chance to do better, you know, once I make a mistake. Okay, so our last three terms, and these are kind of the important ones because these are going to be related to the homework. Goals, obstacles, and rewards. These, these very three simple things basically make up every component of every single game that you've ever played. Uh, everything in a game can be sort of, you know, put into one of these three categories. And so that's what we'll be thinking about as we make our games, how these, what these things are and how they fit together. And for the assignment for this week, you're gonna be looking at these three components of a game that you're either playing now or that you've, you know, uh, played in the past. So here's my, uh, another little drawing where you can see uh, all three of these things very simply expressed. This is obviously like, you know, the basic NES Mario scene. Um, on the right side, we have our goal. It's to get to the end of the level. We have this little flag that represents that. Uh, we actually have two versions of obstacles. We have a, a, you know, a gap in our platform where we can fall. That's one obstacle. We also have 
uh, our little mushroom guy that's gonna you know take away our life. So that's another obstacle. And then we have one of our uh, you know boxes with a question mark that may give us a reward like a coin or a power up. Um, so we have you know all three of these things in one really simple scene. Um, so in a game, you usually have like a uh, an established goal, and it's usually to told to you very explicitly from the beginning. Uh, in Mario, you have to save a princess. Um, sometimes it's a little more vague, uh, like you know, you have to explore uh, an abandoned island is the example I use here, like with a game like Myst or a game like Proteus or something like that. It may be a little less clear what your real goal is, but usually there's a very obvious goal, uh, whether it's just told to you explicitly or whether you learn it through playing the game. Uh, goals uh, or games use obstacles and rewards to lead the player towards a goal. So both of those things actually lead us towards a goal. When you know we're playing the game, we see something that we need to jump over. Uh, we know that it's an obstacle; it could kill us. But we also know if if there's an obstacle there, that means that's the direction I should go in, right? Like there wouldn't be an obstacle there if I wasn't supposed to go over there. Um, so obstacles and rewards both lead us towards the goal in the game. Um, so complex games have a big variety of different types of obstacles and rewards and multiple goals that are often happening all at the same time. So if you think about like real modern games, um, you know, you might have like seven different missions and then like a main mission. Um, Hakem, did you have a question? Yeah, I was going to say that um, like there's certain games, like with the complex games, right? Like uh, uh, Devil May Cry or something. Like it can have like one particular goal in that story. Then afterwards, it can have another one within it. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So that to make a complex game, you may take a bunch of different goals and blend them together. Elijah? Elijah, do you have a question? Oh, I, I forgot I'm thinking to myself. Um, the uh, the right. complex um, of the games, does it normally fall on to like the RPG genre? Oh, no, not at all. Uh, I mean, it, you know, th those games yeah, can no, be very complex. Right. Right. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, it, it sort of depends on what you're talking about, but uh, RPGs do tend to have this this thing where you have like multiple different tasks that you're required to do. Um, but a lot of different types of games can have like very complex uh, systems of goals. Um, but that's a good question. Um, I'm noticing now that we only have a couple minutes left. Um, and I think I actually have like a few more slides. So um, I'm actually just gonna pause here and we'll go over this at the beginning of class on Thursday. Um, but you guys have these notes. You can you can continue reading them. Um, I'm going to stop the recording now since we just have a couple minutes left. Um,